topic. So just a little about me, technology guy, property guy, started in California. So I know a little about the space from that side, both as a borrower or how the platforms are built. I also am doing a crowdfunding campaign in Bank of the Future, so I'm doing the guinea pig, uh, guinea pig thing. Um, so we, the key of crowdfunding, if you listen to the religious types, it's about empowering the crowd to make the decision, okay? And we're gonna cover a little of that today about whether, you, whether the crowd really knows how to make the decision when it comes to funding a loan. So let's do introductions and we'll go one by one. The order of the slides will be the introduction order. It's not necessarily the seating order. So Simon, you're first. Just so real uh, quick. <clears throat> yeah, so uh, good morning everyone. My name is Simon Zucci. Uh, I've been investing in property since 1995. Um, I'm probably better known at these shows, been visiting here for the last 10 years as an educator, I teach people how to invest in property, don't sell property, teach people how to do it themselves. And from my own personal experience, I still do deals, so I think it's important I, I transact in property if I'm teaching other people. In the last two years, I've found that banks sometimes don't quite get us as investors, and I find that bridging can sometimes be quite expensive. So through my own frustration, um, I started dealing with private investors over the last two years. And there's only a limited number of people who've got 50, 100,000 pounds. And I realized that on my database, there are lots of people who've got less money, would love to get into property deals. And there are lots of property investors who have great deals that they're struggling to fund in a tra traditional way. So that's the idea was to put the two together. Um, I, like John, has worked with Bank to the Future and I've brought some technology expertise into the business that I don't have. And uh, we're just about to launch, uh, offering what we think is a, a crowd funding service for property from a slightly different angle from the other businesses in that we come very much from the property investing and development background. And so delighted to be here on the panel today. Cool, so we have a pre-launch platform. <coughs> and Jonathan, you're next. And also highlight, though we're talking about lending quite a bit, I think you're the only panel member, Jonathan, that does equity also. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I'm Jonathan DeCartre, I'm the CEO and founder of Launchpad. <coughs> um, again, we're launching in May um, and we aim to be offering a blend of debt and equity based finance, so giving investors the, the chance to split their portfolio across those two um, asset types. And we'll be launching with properties in London <coughs> and then expanding that into overseas properties, uh, kicking off with Shanghai and Dubai. I'm joined uh, in the management team at Launchpad by uh, ex-investment bankers from RBS and uh, two uh, coder developers from Oxford University uh, and a fund manager and a whole structuring team to ensure that the securitization package that we put into place for investors um, really, really means that you feel comfortable with your investment. Um, so we look forward to, hopefully if you can register on our site, we look forward to engaging with some of you in, in May. Thank you. Very good. And we'll come back to the point about securitization in a minute. So now we have Luke. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Luke Joost. Um, I'm with a company called Funding Circle. Uh, Funding Circle specializes predominantly in financing um, debt facilities for uh, SME trading businesses. Uh, we've been around for about three years, <coughs> since 2010. Um, we've lent so far just over 250 million pounds to over 4,000 small businesses. Um, we've got about 118 staff um, in the UK uh, and about 32 staff and an operation uh, that, that we own in the US. Um, up until now, most of our lending has been, as I said, uh, traditional debt facilities to SME trading companies. Um, but during the three years that we've been in operation, we think we've been absolutely overwhelmed by the amount of borrowers coming to us and saying, can you help us with property finance? Um, because the perception and I guess the reality in the market is that the traditional lenders um, just aren't active in the market, both in the developments um, and investment markets. Um, so my background is um, with Barclays uh, in the UK for the past six and a half years in property finance um, and I'm now obviously looking to bring that expertise um, to Funding Circle and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. Um, our first property loan uh, will go live on uh, Monday morning coincidentally, so I encourage you if you're interested in uh, seeing the types of deals that um, we are going to be putting on our marketplace and uh, keen to invest some money in it. I suggest you, you be there at 8 o'clock, uh, 10 o'clock on Monday morning. So actually I didn't know this when I put the slides in this order, but essentially we've had two sites that are about to launch. 
We have Funding Circle, who's well established as a lender, but not in the property space, who's going to open up property Monday, so about to launch the property side. And then we have a last panel member who has a little bit more experience already. Thanks, John. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Christian Faze from Lend Invest. Um, as John sort of alluded to, I think we come from a slightly different perspective in terms of the uh, the peer-to-peer -peer space in the sense that um, we spun Lend Invest out of an existing mortgage lending business that we'd set up in 2008 called uh, Montello Bridging Finance. Um, so we launched uh, Lend Invest off the back of that uh, in May last year. Um, Montello's lent you know, X hundred millions of pounds. Um, Lend Invest, we've been able to about 50 million pounds of transactions since launching. Um, and we're sort of uh, looking to, to exploit that market. Obviously, there's a huge funding gap in the mortgage market, which everyone knows. I guess in terms of our proposition, we're very much focused on the investor side. Um, coming from being an existing lending platform, um, we've got a number of funds that we run on the Montello side. Um, and effectively, we saw peer-to-peer -peer and the peer-to-peer -peer model as a way to essentially take our proposition online for investors. Um, so that's, that's, that's what we're doing. Cool. So, range of experience in the team members, different range of experience in the actual platforms. Just as a background note, the regulators, the FCA, just published uh, in March the crowdfunding platform uh, regulations for debt and equity. So literally even the FCA has just sort of come out of the gate for April 1st for the regulations. So it is a very new space in most respects. Now, Normally this is where you have to come up with questions, but I know it's a little early on a, Saturday, on a Friday morning, so I'm gonna start the questions. I, I did a bit of homework. Um, and then we're gonna run with you guys. Now, of course you can't see that. I, I'll zoom in when necessary. But I will start calling on you, and I will literally go down and sort of tick out questions, so be thinking. Um, so in particular, in any order on the panel, I'd like you guys to restate what your actual USP is. How do you position your business compared to anyone else in a very you know, elevated type, 30 second, 20 second USP message? And then I want you to cover how do you make money as a platform? Uh, who wants to? Yeah, I can kick that off. Um, so just sort of following on from that, so when we set up Montello in 2008, we had a couple of high net worth investors that would actually fund our transaction. So we do due diligence on the deal, get the investor to fund it. Um, it's a very frustrating way to get any scale in terms of what we're doing, so we subsequently set up a fund. We've now got three funds with that business. But uh, we've always had investors that were quite keen to select their individual deal, um, do their own due diligence. So this is your USP? It is our USP in the sense that... <laughs> 30 seconds. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, <laughs> USP, elevated pitch, is we, we're an existing lending business taking our proposition online. Okay, so existing lending business going online, got it. And you come from, obviously, the background you just said. Jonathan. Yeah, I mean, our, our proposition is very clear. It's offering a blend of debt and equity finance to developers from investors. And it's offering that in UK properties and then emerging property hotspots around the world. Okay. I think our, our USP is um, access to finance and the easier we've made it for people to access finance. Um, it's in our DNA. We understand the frustrations people have had in getting money so far. Um, our technology definitely puts us in a good position and that technology is scalable. Um, and we've got a, a really established investor base um, and our brand is becoming more and more known in the market. So I think that sums it up too. Simon, USP. Um, within the property market, we're fairly well known. USP for your platform. Yeah, and so USP is we come from very much an investor and developer background. And we probably have an inherent understanding and might back deals that traditional lenders may not back. And for the right project and right developer, we'll even go up to 100% finance. Okay, so I'm going to challenge you on that because you're using language that I'm not expecting. Okay. The crowd decides what gets funded, or are you saying you decide? We, we scrutinize the deals we put on the platform. Our reputation, and anyone's reputation, will live or die by the ability of the uh, developer to perform their task. And what I'm suggesting is I think we have pretty, pretty good ways of assessing if it's a good deal or not and assessing the individual to deliver that. Okay. And so we'll, we decide what to put on the platform, and you're absolutely right, the crowd will decide if they want to fund it. Okay. So the other three, I'm not going to go back to you right now, but he's claiming he knows better. <laughs> so how do you make money, Simon? How are you going to make money uh, with your platform? We charge a fee yep. to the developer for a major. There's no entry, no exit, just a, an application and successful, raising the funds them a 5% fee. So successful. Successful, yes. Good. Luke? 
we will charge the borrowing arrangement fee, obviously for the, the time and the cost we invest in putting the deal forward. Um, and then we charge investors who have their money with us um, an annual fee for managing their funds. Okay. Sure. So there's an arrangement fee for the person applying, Correct. and that's based on success or just the application process? That'll be once the money goes out the door on success. Okay, so a success fee, and then Correct. there's a money you manage, you also get a fee in that. Jonathan? Yeah, our revenue streams um, change depending on whether it's debt or equity. So okay. taking debt first, um, a bit like Funding Circle, we, we will um, take arrangement fees um, and probably add just a little bit of um, commission on top of the on, on the loan amount, on the equity side, uh, like most crowdfunding platforms, we charge um, a commission structure from the investor, and obviously the more they invest, then that commission amount comes down. Cool. Uh, with lend investors, a very straightforward proposition. Uh, there's a, an arrangement fee, and then there's a fee to the investor, which is equivalent to a percentage of the gross interest rate, which is charged to the borrower. Okay, so you're, again, like earlier, a bit on both sides, okay, yeah. cool. Any questions on that? So, how does the crowd provide the funding in the model, whoever wants to start? And are you open to retail investors based on the FCA's definition of retail investor? Who wants to dive in? Because I'll pick otherwise. <laughs> Luke, I saw that hand. Yes, yeah, so, so I mean, what, what we as a company do is essentially um, create the infrastructure and the mechanism that links borrowers and investors. So if, if anybody in the, in the audience, for example, is a property developer, uh, we will work up a scheme um, that in essence comes to their borrowing application. Uh, we then take that borrowing application with all the detail and transparency that goes around that, put it onto the marketplace, and that then becomes visible to all our investors. Um, so John, I think to answer your question, we create that mechanism, investors <coughs> come along, they go on to um, a raft of deals that they could potentially fund, they look at the deals, assess uh, the risk, the return, um, and other aspects that might engage them or disengage them. Um, and if they like their money, then they put their money into the deal, okay. the deal closes and they start getting the return uh, once the money so goes out. So the investor decides and how much you as a platform attract dictates how much capacity you have. It is, but I, but I think Simon touched on an important point. I think we have um, responsibility to have a really good filtering process to make sure that only good quality deals get to that marketplace. Um, I think the temptation is, um, as the hype around the sector, sector keeps growing and people start trying to get on to um, the ladder in terms of the, the platform, um, that they just open their marketplace to anybody who's looking for deals and, and deals that don't make sense um, and probably attract investors in at a very high rate. Uh, the risk to us as an industry is that, that impairment starts landing or that bad debt starts landing really quickly. Okay. Yeah, so there is an industry risk if the, if the rogue elements become... I mean, my view is that it's a huge risk for the industry. Yeah. Cool. Who's next? So yeah, I'll just quickly jump in. On the, on the essentially what we're talking about, the due diligence of the properties, this is obviously a key aspect that investors will want to know. Um, the way we've tried to solve that problem is like my co-founder, Graham Dornan, who's uh, processed about £1.5 billion pounds worth of property transactions, has um, written a, a four levels of, of tier of due diligence that we put developments through, which start with cash flow forecasts and, and, and ends all the way at the end with um, the um, security packages and the, the PE insurance that developers have, so that we have uh, a, a very good um, stability of, of quality control on the site. Well, you think you will. Well, we'll hope Given that you're a favorite. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we, we've started the deal flow process yeah. now, so obviously we're yeah. screening out those developers, good. and there are lots okay. of good developments out there for to choose from. Right. In, in terms of the, the <coughs> audience that we're looking to, on, the, on those investors that want to provide debt-based finance to property developments, we'll be offering that to retail investors here. So and on the retail e define the way the new 14.4 legislation e does. Exactly, committing that. So for those that don't know, Historically, retail investors are not allowed to participate in more or less this type of place. And under the new legislation from the FCA, they're opening up the market on crowdfunding platforms to retail investors if they fit very specific criteria. And the FCA has published what that criteria is. Yeah, uh, with Lend Invest, we're a little bit different in the sense that um, we've got our own balance sheet with the Montello side of the business. So. Um, if, if a loan comes to us, we're sort of, you know, obviously sourcing deal flow all the time. If we underwrite the loan and we're happy with it, we'll write it. Um, so we've effectively funded the borrower. Um, they've got their funding and they're off doing whatever they're doing. 
Um, what we then do is take the loan and put it up on LendInvest for investors to invest in. It's not, at the moment, a retail investment proposition. So at the moment, it's a £10,000 minimum investment because we are targeting sort of high net worth or more sophisticated investors. Um, for us, we think that, um, you know, probably touching on what John's alluding to in terms of underwriting a loan takes skill. We, we bear a lot of that burden, but at the same time, we don't necessarily think that, you know, mum and pup should be putting in 50 pounds um, necessarily into these loans. But that's just our view at the moment. That's how we, we operate. Okay, Simon? Um, we do want to target retail investors, uh, and actually our lawyers are guiding us through the FCA process, because as you know, it's all changed. Mm -hmm. um, but also, uh, prior to all of that, um, we're actually working with intermediaries who are dealing with certified high net worth individuals for whom the returns we're offering, because there's first charge security, are actually quite attractive. So we're, we're going to both markets. So you, in a sense, you're doing lending in the normal world. Yes. And the crowdfunding side, you're going to be FCA approved. Absolutely, yes. So we have, for that. we have interim permission at the moment, okay. and our obviously credit license, and we have to wait and see what the FCA decide. Okay. So in a different scale, lend investors, they have their own fund, they have their own business, they do yeah. loans, and then if they want, they can take loans onto the platform. Now, just a subtlety, and it's a little bit later, but I'll mention it here. What Lend Invest just described is they are literally taking on 100% of the loan and then what I call securitization, letting pieces of that loan be sold off on the platform. But if you're a borrower, you've already gotten a commitment for the loan. You're not waiting for the crowd to decide. It's a big difference, particularly if you need to get the money in two to four weeks rather than two to three months on a crowdfunding platform. So underwriting, I think we've sort of covered this. Um, underwriting as in the platform is pre-filtering what might go up on the platform. So supposedly what's on the platform is better. Are you happy to get sued if you do a bad job? Maybe well, happy is not the right word, but <laughs> I mean, are we doing like, you know, underwriting, well, I thought about it for 20 minutes, or are we doing real underwriting where you own that loan, and if it doesn't go well, that's your problem, not the crowd's. So in our mm. case of you, we do every best attempt, and I say our reputation will, will live or die by the reputation and quality of the deals. We do everything we can. But anyone who's been involved in property, anyone who's got any experience will know things always happen, things go wrong. Okay. So the way that we're underwriting it is we're only taking all deals which actually we would personally do ourselves. So if there's an issue triggered by certain um, criteria, we will actually plan to step in and take that over to ensure that the uh, lenders get their funds and interest returned to them. Now, to be able to do that, I have uh, some private financiers who have very deep pockets who are prepared to step in, who worked with me in the past, and that means that we're going to have a slower growth, but I'd much have a slower growth and a high success rate than, as we've heard before, you know, people might want to, um, it's tempting to, to expand the market and maybe take the wrong deals on. So I think that for the whole industry, we have to all be very, very careful with deals we put on. So. To summarize it slightly, you, you're saying that your platform is going to take on the liability for bad deals. Um, I wouldn't quite put it that way, John, if you weren't careful what you say. Um, I'd also, I'd encourage, I mean, the great thing about property, as opposed to maybe funding a business or an individual, is that anyone who's got their head screwed on um, should be able to do their own due diligence. We've got a building here. Uh, you know, go on right move. How much is it worth? How much oh, are you oh, for? Oh, let me check. Yeah, so, no. two things. First of all, if this is the crowd and you're the platforms, other, yeah. than, other than Jonathan, all they can get access to is a piece of a loan. They're not investing in property. So let's say that they're buying loans, they're not buying property. Yeah. And even professional bankers don't seem to get the underwriting right. That's why we, the taxpayers, bail them out. Yeah. So I'm not so convinced that someone who has experience in banking is going to get it right this time than the last time. At the same time, banks do billions and billions and trillions of loans, and most of them do go right. So there is something, there is a method to the madness. I, so, but otherwise, to summarize, I think you're saying that you have some sort of financial facility that you're willing to disclose to the crowd that will back up dud loans. Yeah, I wouldn't call them dud loans because we wouldn't, the, the great thing about property, the deals we'll take on, are things where we can easily see how the value is being added. And so we're taking on very profitable projects and so the nature of that is we'd be more than happy to step in if for any reason the developer doesn't perform. Now, we don't want to do that because we want developers to bring good deals to us that they can execute. 
What I'm saying is we, we would be prepared to step in and we have had conversation and we're just getting letter of intent from uh, our backers. So we can provide that evidence if required by investors. Well, as, but, a, but I would as also an FCA say, approved platform, if you were going to make that claim, the FCA would want you to uh, show the evidence. Exa and that's exactly what our uh, lawyers are advising us yeah. to do. The one thing I would say is though, and I think we'll make this very clear on our website, I don't know what the others are doing. But I think well, we're going to get to them real quick. Okay, so just one thing is, I think just because something's on a peer-to-peer -peer platform, I don't think the lender can absolve themselves from any responsibility. You know, well, the lender need, is the crowd. Yeah, no, but I'm saying they can't absolve themselves. They, yeah, right. they need to take some so responsibility. So as the crowd, you have to own up to the fact that things can happen. Car crashes happen. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, this is... Should, so can we ask the crowd if you think that's reasonable or not? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but, but to what, uh, you know, I think okay, we, we have a slightly different view on this and sort of following on from Luke was saying in terms of, you know, this is a burgeoning sector, you know, the numbers aren't massive, but if you look at what's happening in the US and, you know, certainly like with funding, so, you know, they are starting to get pretty serious volume um, and, and are a serious business. But underwriting alone takes skill. Um, in our first year of lending, it was by far our worst year of lending. And you learn as you go along. Um, and, you know, there's hundreds of checks that we will do on a borrower, and that's that's a refined process that we've evolved over a number of years. You know, six years of lending. One of the big problems we have is that these platforms may see it as an opportunity to essentially outsource underwriting loans to the masses, and the real risk of that is people will be chasing return. They'll be taking um, carte blanche what the platform how they're presenting the loan. And that may not actually be a true understanding of what is going on. I mean, we saw a perfect example of this a few weeks ago. There was a valuation floating around the market and you guys may have seen it. It was um, valuing a property of like 700,000 um, pounds. There was a special assumption in the valuation that the property was complete. And actually when our valuer went around and looked at it, the property wasn't complete. Now th there's a real risk that that loan could end up on a platform. You know, it's a 700 grand property um, you know, 50% LTV or something that seems really attractive. The crowd thinks that's great. They chase the return they're in, but you know they're, they're investing against a half-complete property. So, you know, there's all sorts of risks with um, lending, and we think that lending against property is you know is a skill set. So we actually view our business. We're a lending business. So we you know we take full ownership of the loans. Uh, we're happy to do that, um, and effectively um, you know we we underwrite it. We underwrite a loan the same way a bank would underwrite a loan. And we openly say that in all our marketing documents. Luke or Jonathan? So, I mean, do you mind? I mean, I'm absolutely paranoid about credit risk. I mean, I used to, I sat on the credit risk of Barclays Corporate Real Estate um, in 2008, just as the world started ending. Um, so I'm absolutely paranoid about, about it, but I think in, in a good way for the right reasons. Um, I probably disagree with Simon that it's easy to see value in a property development, really because I've just seen value wiped out from uh, large balance sheets quicker than uh, the seminar one asked. Um, but very importantly, I think um, from a crowd perspective, uh, property deals are very involved. There's a lot of diligence that goes into them. They're very intricate. And I think the balance that we need to get to is how you um, convey that sense to the crowd so they get a good, really good understanding of what the deal is about. Um, and how you balance that again against going into too much diligence that when you present it to, to borrowers, they look at it and they say, this is just too complicated for me and I, I'm, um, I'm not going to put my money into it. Um, but, but I agree, sorry, just to finish off, I do agree. Um, the risk is that people come on as um, crowdfunders and, and outsource the risk to borrowers. I think that's absolutely wrong. Um, there's an onus on who's ever presenting that deal to their, their borrowers that they've done the right diligence, they've gone through the right processes. Um, and they would essentially be prepared, prepared to lend their own money. Okay, Jonathan. And particularly, Jonathan, can you touch on also the equity side, given the, you're the only representative? Yeah, sure. I think the, the key thing for us is to, to start off by putting these uh, four tiers of due diligence to, to screen out properties which have high risk. And once we've listed a project on our platform, there is um, a security package around that which we put into place which protects the investor as much as we possibly can and we would encourage those investors to, to obviously look at the due diligence we've done to look at the information on the projects that we put up on the platform and after the crowdfunding is complete there will be options to the investors if they wish to put in some more money to, to engage specialists and experts to do more due diligence if they feel that's necessary and 
the key thing for us is, you know, with all the best intention in the world, if a property development or investment goes wrong, what we need to have and what we put into place are mechanisms where if we hit that liquidity event and there's a credit um, problem, that there are independent administrators that come in <coughs> that will try to retrieve as much of the original investment money as possible to return back to those investors. Okay, so <coughs> give these guys a break for a second, then you're going to have to come up with questions. So how many here have savings at 1% to 3% in a bank account or something? Okay. So if they were offering you 6, 7, 8, 10% or more, would it look attractive? Yeah. Now, your savings account has government backing up to 80,000 pounds or 82, whatever the number is. Okay? Meaning someone, the taxpayer, is going to make sure that the money's still there. You put it into any of these loans, it's not going to happen. There's no government backing. Does that change how you view your savings versus buying pieces of loans? Yeah. Still happy to buy loans? Cool. Okay. Well, it's these the are these So, it's the return. what do we want to know? It's about return. Yeah. John, yeah. John, can I come in on that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's interesting. It's been interesting for me making the switch from the banking sector into uh, the crowd sector. Um, in a banking sector, when you're lending money, obviously you you're diligent and you go through the process. Um, but it's very different when you've got a pile of money behind you and you're issuing checks out to fund, um, as opposed to where I am now, where you know you've got real people with real faces and families and savings and hard-earned cash that have gone in. Um, and if anything, that's made me even more determined to be diligent, do the right deals, say no to the right decisions. So, I mean, it's just a nuance, but for me, it's, it's been really interesting. So, I think genuinely, I can certainly say this for, for us. I mean, we have a genuine interest in, in our borrowers and, and protecting them and not exposing them to bad deals. So, question. Rory. Hi. Um, I'm just interested in the cost of doing the due diligence. It's incredibly high. So, in terms of volume, because some, um, so, two parts, really. What sort of volumes are you able to handle? And who carries the cost of the due diligence? Because it's not a tenant job. So at least for the platforms that are live, or are the ones that are planning to go live, how do you estimate the cost of due diligence? Yeah, we're, 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 we've got, um, yeah, people support. We, we get that question quite a lot. I mean, it is very difficult. I mean, there's a number of sort of steps to the equation. One, one is generating deal flow, because a key point for us to try and sort of source and create an online portfolio for um, investors to be able to invest in is to you know cast the net as wide as possible so you can filter that down to the best lending opportunity so that deal flow generation in itself is, is very difficult so things like um, you know this expo today you know, having a stand here um, putting out the message in terms of what we do and that sort of thing um, but then in terms of the underwriting um, that that's just a cost that we bear it is a significant cost um, but it's a cost of doing business. I think the reality is we're, we're an online business, so there are synergies and efficiencies that we can gain um, in terms of, in comparison to perhaps the cost for a bank to write a loan. Um, and there's been various studies in terms of look at, in comparing you know, the cost for a peer-to-peer -peer platform to originate the loan as opposed to a bank with branches and uh, you know, fairly heavy regulation and capital adequacy requirements and all those sorts of things. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, that, that, that's just a cost, cost of the business. Anyone else? I, mean, I, I would add to it, I think, um, again, it's been interesting for me, and I'm sorry to come back to this, but it, but it really is. If you look at um, the jobs that people are doing originating loans in the bank, I know for a fact that because, I mean, banks are built up over time, so there's lots of systems and processes that, that evolve, don't talk to each other. Um, and genuinely, people, if they were handing a deal, would spend 70% of their time doing valueless work in terms of procedures and systems and, and trying to get everything to match up. Um, and I, I guess where we are now, we don't have any of that legacy. So firstly, the majority of the work that we're doing is actually assessing the deal and the borrower and um, making sure it stacks up. Um, and I think that gives us a big advantage over the banks. And that, that's, it's no surprise that, I mean, the cost lines are under massive pressure at the moment. And you can see the cost of programs that are running across banks at the moment. And I, I think it recognizes that. Can I just relate to that? You know, particularly if you're looking at um, development funding, so let's say it's not in London, it could be in Birmingham. Someone has a magician tree, so you be prepared, you carry the cost for the full development appraisal, because someone's got to go on site, you can't do a desktop valuation. Um, and you need to know that if you're using your surveyor, they've got to be local, Absolutely. because they've got to understand within that sort of facility. That's all carried by at your cost, and that's part of the cost of doing business. So I, mean, I can speak for, for, for us and we've lined up to the market. So we will do the diligence in terms of the appraisal, structuring the deal, etc. 
uh, when we send a valuer out, and I agree, we, we don't do desktop valuations full stop, so we will send a valuation out, uh, uh, valuer out, do a professional valuation, uh, the borrower bears the cost for that. Uh, we will send a monitoring survey out if it's a complicated scheme um, to do an initial costing of the project, um, and if it requires ongoing monitoring to monitor the construction risk, um, we'll do that, and, and the borrower will bear the cost for that. We'll obviously take that into account in the full development appraisal, um, and the commercials of the appraisal will need to stack up, understanding all those costs will be carried. So can I just ask one? Can I just answer that? Can I just answer that? That way, on that point, what we're doing is we, we have a, a several stage process um, we're, and we haven't finalised all this yet because we haven't quite launched, but we are already assessing deals that have come through to us. So one of the things we're doing is we, we have some criteria that we ask the, uh, the developers to check, look, do we match your criteria? For example, because of the time taken and the depth and the expense, initially we're only going to take loans for a minimum of 400000 um, because we want to cut down some of the volume initially. And so there'll be a process where people will come forward and we'll do, we will do an initial desktop evaluation, say, is this the kind of thing we think we would lend? If it is something we would look, want to look into the full due diligence, we will then make a fee of approximately a thousand pounds, which will include the survey by the local charter surveyors to establish exactly what it's worth, what the development potential is. So in a way, that's a slight barrier to entry, but again, it comes back to just absolutely making sure we put the best deals on there. The slight benefit we have as well, have a, having a, a nation, nation, nationwide network of meetings, we have a local um, uh, representation in most cities around the country, we have a lot of local contacts and we have a real grassroots um, feeling of if someone says I'm doing this development and sell these flats at this amount, we can get a very, very accurate feeling, is that a realistic idea of how much those properties are going to be worth or not, because we have those grassroots contacts. Okay. Other questions? Can I just ask, uh, Christine, please, for your platform, it's different though if, if the loans are already being written down, then that's a fee that's taken away from the platform separately, so it's not something that you Yeah, it is, to. and I should point out, we're, we're the same as funding circle in the sense that uh, on the Montello side, when the loan is originated in terms of that actual due diligence of that loan, you know, the borrower will pay for the valuation and the borrower will pay for the legals as well. Yeah. I've got a couple of questions actually. From the investor side, if I'm, if I'm interested in putting 100 grand into a project on your platform, well, is there anything that I can do just to check it out further? I mean, can I go visit the sites, etc., etc., to make sure it's I'm comfortable with it? Who wants that? So that. <laughs> so on as we will give you as much information as we can in terms of um, the the plan and the figures, so so if you have some experience and I encourage people to do the right research, you can get a really good sense of, yeah, d does this feel right to me? If you don't understand an, a, an opportunity and in investment, you should not be investing and putting your money into it. And, and we're gonna make that very clear on our platform. And because I come from the education background, that's you know, something I'm really passionate about. Uh, logistically, could you get investors going to visit sites? I don't know about anyone else, but I think that'd be very difficult to coordinate, to manage, um, and so from our point of view, that's not something we're considering. Are you going to allow online conversation without a deal? Uh, no, we're not, because um, if someone's online, and, and I know a lot of um, platforms do that because of the social media element, but you might get people giving views <coughs> and opinions which may not be correct. Right. right. So we're not going to encourage that. Okay. Anyone so else? Can I jump in just on that point? Do you, do you go through exchange of contracts and then obviously push out to get the money coming in and it's within a window that you may not go to completion? Yeah, some of the particular right. deals we're looking at are ones where uh, either property is skewed on an option or there might be delayed completion. And you know sometimes people will have private funds secured and they're coming to us because actually it's a more cost effective way of them borrowing money. So the challenge with any crowd pla crowdfunding platform, unless you're, you're in a great position that um, lend investor where they, they, they have the funds already, um, if we're putting it out to the crowd, there is a risk that it doesn't happen in time. So we're trying to select things where actually time is not so much of an important criteria because they have an option or a delayed completion in place. Someone could view during that, that uh, funding window that they wanted to drive so out. So someone could? Could go and view if they wanted to during the funding um, Yeah, I guess they could do, but I, I'm not going to commit to that. That would be down. Obviously, the developer keen to raise funds might decide to have open days, etc. On my personal development schemes, that's what I have done in the past. But that would be down to the developer to organize. Charles? Yeah, I just want to return back to this gentleman's question about um, uh, viewing the property. I, I think one of the key things we, we 
we really decided with Launchpad when we were originating it is that the difference about property crowdfunding, and this is what separates it from like a real, real estate investment trust where you're just putting your money into a, into a blind fund, is that there is a direct emotional connection to your investment. And so we want people to go to the platform and be able to obviously look at all the details and survey reports, but we want them to look at the, the back history of the credibility of the developer and see testimonials and projects and how much money he's made for other people. And if they want to go and view the site, then we would expect if that person's putting in a significant amount, like you were saying, £100,000, we would expect the developer to throw open the doors to that and invite people in for that, because this is people you know, having a, a direct line of sight to their to their. Yeah, in your case, you're also doing equity though too, so it's exactly. a slightly different relationship. Yeah, it's different. So exactly. I, mean, I, I would come in there, I would, I would support that. Um, for example, I mean, you need to be sensitive when there's an exchange happening. Um, so you, you're limited in terms of what you can divulge because somebody might see something on the marketplace, want to underwrite, uh, undercut the, the, the transaction that's already in place. Yeah. Um, but for example, where, where the developer already owns the land and is now looking for funding to build it out, um, I think if you just do a fair amount of diligence online, you'll, un you'll be able to understand where that property is really, really quickly. I mean, I mean, if you want to take a drive out there, we obviously can't stop you. I think the danger is when um, people's own preferences start coming into the deal. So going to the developer and saying, well, I'm not sure about the tiling over there, I'm not sure about the window over there, and I'm giving you the money. I think that starts to get really dangerous. So th there needs to be a cut-off point somewhere. But absolutely, I mean, it's, it's, it's a tangible asset. It's something very real. Um, a development scheme is special because you can literally see your money being put to work and coming out of the ground to completion. Um, so why shouldn't you be able to cast a very up close eye? I mean, the, the question kind of came from stuff in the past I've looked at, which ultimately is all BS, which never existed. So I, I appreciate this is a different level of the FCA being involved, but that's not where the question originated from. Um, my other question was on the opposite side. If I'm looking for, for funding, how do you guys classify the developer? Yeah. In terms of you know, is, you mentioned that there's, I think somebody mentioned Simon who said 400 grand plus, was it? Yeah, that's um, right. But how, how do you, how, how do you determine whether myself is a, you know, I'm a suitable developer? That's I'm easy. Ready? Initially for us, it's got to be track record. Um, you know, if uh, in the property education world, I mean, lots of people who who watch, uh, you know, Property Ladder, think it's a great idea to get the property and they have this great million pound deal, they have no experience and, and you know, they're never going to do it and none of us, would, I'm sure, ever lend money to them to do that deal. You've got to know what you're doing. We're talking about projects here, especially using other people's money, you've got to make sure you know what you're doing. So for me, that comes down to track record, comes down to exactly what they've done, how much money they've made before, um, and, and, and actually maybe having a portfolio of properties. Um, now, you've got to start somewhere, obviously, and a good place to start with people is working on joint ventures with people. But for us initially, you've got to have a track record and we've got to understand you know what you're doing. I mean, I'm, I'm not picking on you, but I've, I've probably, it's not that easy to be honest in terms of understanding that. So I agree with Simon on absolutely the need to have the right track record. The nuances come in where somebody, for example, is, is very uh, competent in building some type of scheme, for example, <coughs> offices or hotels, but now wants to come in and develop an eight house uh, complex in London. Those, those projects are night and day. So to somebody like that could probably say no because it needs to be a similar type of project that you've done before. Um, the real challenge, I guess, is when you've got um, people that haven't been developers themselves that want to employ the right professional team around them. Um, and I say, well, there's no risk because this guy's built properties for, for the past 10 years. I mean, the reality is that professional team could, could walk away really, really quickly. Um, and the developer or the borrower is set alone and needs to employ somebody else in. So those are the type of the nuances yeah. that make it a little bit more difficult, but absolutely it's only people that have are tried and tested on similar types of schemes in, in areas that they know how to operate in. So is it, kind of, is it primarily new build stuff? Yeah, yeah, so Chris, what, what, no, I was just going to say, uh, with us it's a little bit different in the sense that we, I mean, I can't agree with Luke in terms of, we think it is very difficult, you know, um, in terms of assessing a property developer. And whilst we do fund property developments, we're more focused on the short term mortgage lending space. So. Um, we're looking at it very much from an asset lend, and part of that equation is not so important in terms of the, the borrower's ability to do something with that property. Um, so it's uh, you know it's more traditional bridging um, or sort of a term product where maybe there's a planning gain, but we've we've assessed the property on its as-is value. So whether they get the planning gain or not, it won't impact the value of our security. Okay. Yeah. Classic bridging. Gavin. Yeah, hi, I was just interested in following on from all the other points. I'd be interested to know the timing from applying for the loan to actually drawing down the loan from, from each of you. 
Yeah, it's some of Christian and work for, for us. And by the way, Gavin, I don't know if you heard earlier, but two of the sites aren't even up yet, and one's only going up on Monday. So the first answer might be the only answer that's <laughs> tracked. <laughs> um, yeah, so we just to be clear, South's not going up on Monday. The first <laughs> subsidy is going up. The real one. We don't care about consumer lending. That's for the other people. We're all property people. Um, yeah, so um, given that Montello is, we're a bridging lender, so on all of our marketing material, and it annoys some of our competitors, which we, we love, we sort of say that um, if it's not complete within two weeks, then it's not bridging. So for us, it's sort of one to two weeks, we'll, we'll complete the transaction. Uh, for us, the, the campaign window to actually raise the funds, we're trying to minimise down to a month or even shorter, so that's that's the, the ceiling for that. And then again, it's a, a, a two-week transaction after that. And obviously, in that month's time, you're carrying out with your due diligence, sir? The no. due diligence will be done before the campaign. Yeah. Before, before the campaign. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I mean, where we are at the moment is, once we get a completed pack that we're obviously able to assess, um, we'll get a, a credit-approved offer to the borrower within 48 hours. Um, if that is approved, then we'll instruct evaluation. Um, value is, as you can imagine, across the UK at least stacked at the moment, so they, they're taking 10 days to turn that around. But once we get the valuation in, it's, it's uh, a 48-hour process to move to a final approval. Um, and then, unfortunately, we're hands in the, in the hands of solicitors. Um, and what we're finding at the moment is that is anything between um, three to eight weeks. Uh, we've got about 10 million pounds worth of new property deals that are in, in various stages. Um, and it's look, it looks like it's going to average out about four weeks on the So needle. just to clarify, so you do whatever you do to get it onto the platform. We, so, so to clarify, we will only list the deal once all that diligence is done. Right. So and then it's I, listed, and then are you funding it? And then you already funded it. Then you put it on the platform, or are you letting the crowd fund it, which means it's up to how long the crowd takes. So we take an empty loan to the platform. Yep. Um, it falls from the crowd as they fund. Once it falls, we close it. Yep. Take it off the platform and disperse the money to the borrowers or solicitors so or agents. So it could be very quick or it could be very slow depending on how good your crowd is. Absolutely. It's because it's the platforms are not supplying the crowd, you're supplying the crowd for most of your deals. And John, it's not, it's not only how good the crowd is, it's how good the deal is. Yeah, yeah exactly. The, the, the good deal is going to attract money in a lot quicker than, than the shaky deal. Okay. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd, we're exactly the same, and it's untested, so I don't know. Yeah. Um, the only thing I'd say, I think our research, because the time it is taking so best to get out these days, is probably going to be three weeks. And that, again, that's to even get listed on the platform. Absolutely, yeah. And so it could take, who knows how long. Based on what Gavin was asking in a sense, there's a lot of homework that has to be done before you're even allowed to be in the platform. Yeah. Only in one case will they actually make a lending decision and fund before they go to the platform, which yeah. is where Christian is. The other is, if, you're, if your deal's a great deal, but you have a bad crowd, no one knows you, it's gonna take a while to get funded. Unless, I guess the funding circle in a couple of the US firms, they tend to have large crowds already. And even though you don't have a brand on the platform, you may then still attract money from the existing crowd. It's very early stages of crowdfunding. It might be more dependent on your network than anything else. Back to Rory, I guess. But then I want someone else that has an asked question. Um, so a couple of things. What LTVs are you proposing to work on? Uh, what rate would you expect to charge the borrower? And will you fund in drawdown? So, however, <laughs> <laughs> just disclose everything. Well, I think we're quite competitive, so I'll go first. But this is it's all new, you know, it's untested. So what we propose so what you to think do, you're doing, yeah. what I think we're doing, yeah. as the caveat, is um, we have two core products. One is development finance, where people are generally building, some, buying some land or, or taking existing building and adding significant value. So there's two elements. There's the purchase and then there's the build. The build will be very much on a drawdown facility that will happen approved by um, surveyors checking the work's done to make sure the work's being done properly, okay? We will charge um, a 5% uh, arrangement fee to the developer. We make no margin on the interest rates. The interest rate the developer will offer for the loan to the crowd will be 10% per annum. And um, we believe if that typical project will be a six to 18 month project for the kind of deals we're looking at, okay? For the, and the caveat here is for the right deal and the right developer, being very careful about deals we put on because of our reputation, we will lend up to 100% of the cost, but there must be significant profit in there to make sure we're probably about 70% of the loan to value of the project once completed. The GDB. The GDB, yeah. So that's the first part. The second product is a refinance product where 
it's completed its tent is far less risk um, and much easier to, for um, the crowd to assess as well. That will be a product that is typically a two to three year product, up to 70% loan to value, and it will pay, we anticipate, a 6% per annum return, paid on a monthly basis. The first one, by the way, is rolled up, but the second refinance paid on a monthly basis. Um, and I think that will be particularly attractive to people who might want to, we've just heard the announcement about ISAs and the ability to lend uh, through peer-to-peer -peer lending, and the rates going up to 15,000. I think that will appeal very well to that particular group because effectively, if it all happens as expected, it could well be a tax-free return. Okay. So, so I think if there's one thing I've learned in the property game, um, that, that LTV is um, probably not only irrelevant, um, but it's dangerous in terms of, the first question always is what, what LTV to go to. And the reality is this is my, very, my, my opinion, it's, it's irrelevant. So um, on investment <coughs> deals, you should size the debt by how much the, the rental income from the property can service the debt. Um, so you can't get to a stage where the debt that you have to pay every month is more than the property is generated in income because then you're underwater. So we, we will size our, our debt transactions based on the debt service cover, um, and that depends. The value on that could be, you know, it could be a 30% LTV, it could be 80% LTV. Is this repayment or interest only? So this is capital and interest. Okay. Uh, but the point is, there's, there's no having a no no use in having a 10% LTV um, if the debt can't service itself. That's the reality. I think on the on the development stuff, um, we will structure the the debt facility <coughs> against the land value, which is obviously going to be developed out, and will go up to 70% of the land value. <coughs> Um, or cost that, that it was purchased for, and then we'll finance 60% um, of the bulk cost. But important to say, I think that is, that is how you size the debt. The mechanism could be slightly different. For example, if a de developer o already owns a piece of land that he paid a million pounds for, um, and he only needs a million pounds to develop it out, then obviously we'd fund 100% of that, um, but we would have first charge over the whole property. So there's a fair chunk of his equity already in the deal. Um, just on pricing, uh, we would charge anything between um, six to ten percent depending on on the risk profile uh, where we're looking at deals that we're pricing at the moment i'd say we're typically um seven and a half and eight and a half in that range uh, and we'll charge the borrower a one percent origination fee okay very good just the last point to cover off we will also um, employ monitoring surveyors to uh, monitor the, the progress of a build on the development loan uh, and we won't release any monies or go for more money on a listing unless that monitoring surveyor report comes back in our model is very similar to Simon's actually, so we're looking at a 7 to 10% interest rate, and about 70%, 50 percent And fee? Um, interest, well, in, in and out fees. The fees that you're charging the borrower, independent of what the investors are getting? Uh, 5%. Okay. Um, historically, with our lending, so in the last six years, we've averaged between 60 and 65% LTV, um, based on an as-is value, which is what we always look at. Um, it's because it's bridging in its short term, it's probably slightly more expensive than, than mainstream funding, or it is more expensive. So across our book, we sort of charge about 12 to 13 percent on on an annualised basis. Um, but the average duration for the loan is about five to six months. So it's really for all those property entrepreneurs, it's a cost of doing the transaction. Um, yeah, so that's okay. Other questions? Anyone that hasn't asked a question yet? Yeah, my vote. Okay. How do you deal with uh, launches in the sense of um, the legal packs sometimes only come out a week before the auction is due to go and your due diligence that squeezes you right down on behalf of your investors? But also if, for example, as a developer I'd be willing to pay a deposit on the scheme on the success of the auction, then they're going to make me complete in 20 days, which I'm relying on the investors' money from your platforms to pay off. Yeah. If I don't get that, I lose my deposit. How would you deal with that sort yeah, of thing? I need some bridging finance. <laughs> 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 I'll just go to a bridge. Yeah, yeah. Don't go to a bridge. We can't help you on that. So Simon's platforms might help. Christian's help that, like definitely, you know, the, either his existing business or the platform will just deal with it. Yeah. 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 I think what, 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 you, what you've highlighted is one of the systemic problems of crowdfunding. Uh, you know, you've, got a, you've got a funding window, and obviously property deals need sometimes need to be very, very quick. Now, the only way that we um, have come up with a mechanism to try to reduce that or mitigate that issue is to allow established developers like yourself to put up a proposition on the platform. You say, look, this is the type of deal that I'm looking for. It's the type of property that I want to, to, to bring in. 
investors can pledge money to you, so they're not actually giving you the money, but they pledge that on the basis that if you find your project, they've got a very tiny window, say a week, where they have to make good on that pledge. So that should hopefully give the developers like you, um, you know, access to the money in the time span that you need. So that's really what our online CV, what we've done a bit about us projects, and so they can go, yeah? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I'm, the, I'm looking for this type of project, you know, residential, this area, this amount, this yeah. ROI. So I hope to give them all the stats where they can make a, a you know, fair assessment that, okay, I'll back this guy. So it's a concept, and you're depending on their pledges, which if they don't perform, you still don't get your money. Yeah. So reputational value of the pledgers starts to be an issue. So hopefully the platform will show you they've pledged 10 times, they've performed 10 times, versus they've pledged 10 times that they've never performed. So. Other questions? Go for it. Uh, just going back to the, the question of the, the funding window, uh, you, you want that to be as quick and as short as, as possible, really. Um, so you want more people coming in quickly. You want to get the word out there. In light of 14.4 and, and presumably having to ensure you have the right sort of people coming in, your, your control mechanism is some sort of screening, a bit like CEDARS, for example, where we need to go through a self-cert, something like that. Will you mass promote and then use your, your control mechanism as a sort of gatekeeper? Yes. <laughs> so, so Simon's probably got a quite broad sort of model. I would say Christian is probably the other side of it, which is yeah. a much higher barrier to entry, at least based on the current business. How about the Luke and John? So, I mean, we've, we've got 22,000 registered um, investors on our, on our, model. On our yeah. platform. So we would, we would treat uh, the property investors in the same way. But those, they are, they are on your system or in your, on your books because they have been pre-screened. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm talking about mass marketing to get everybody from out there interested, but then you've obviously got to screen those before you but can But they would get register the, the same way as, as anybody who hopefully yeah. leaves the room today yeah. and signs yeah. up. Yeah. Haven't so you seen thing. Funding Circles ads on the tube? So under 14.4, the legislation for the FCA, these platforms have to do the same screening, whether it's property or little yeah. person loans. Okay. Can, I, can I just make an important point on that? So I think it's, it relates to funding circle, um, but the government has um, lent about, it would have lent about 60 million pounds to us. Um, so the government has found, found it comfortable with the way that we operate to give us 60 million pounds of people on, on lent to, to SMEs. Um, so I think that's, that's a real recognition of trust and, and credibility for, for all of us in the industry for government willing to do that. So it's, it's not fly by night stuff that we're going to get people and take their money and disappear. Absolutely. Uh, sorry, last point, the diligence we went through with the government to get that money, as you can imagine, was, <laughs> was life-changing. So, <laughs> so after that process, we, we are very comfortable that um, our process is correct. There's no guarantees in life, but there, there was quite a process to come up with the new legislation. So we're almost out of time. You had a question? Quick one? Yeah. How will the um, remuner of the there's obviously a potential conflict of interest. Will it be paid on a deal by deal basis? So your underwriting no. people are in house, yeah. or so it's just an operating cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's no conflict because there, it's, it's the platform. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely no incentive. Uh, it's probably the other way around. There's a disincentive if, if they get stuff wrong and it starts landing. They get sacked. Yeah. So <laughs> they're definitely not incentivized to write business. So, last question, and then if you have others, I encourage you to talk to people here. If you need more time, uh, Okay, the show organizer said we can continue. So, it won't be the last yeah, my, question. My question is for Luke, really. Yeah. Ahead. Has the government extended its 10% to the property deals as well? No, property is excluded um, for, for the moment. Um, obviously, uh, a condition of them lending the money is, is it needs to be a tried and tested um, pool of borrowers that it goes to. Uh, for funding circle, it's, it's new. Um, so to answer your question, ahead, which I think is which I think is right to be honest. All right, again. Sorry. Um, come back to uh, due diligence. If you get it horribly wrong, either it's the valuation or the actual work that the underwriters have meant to undertake. As an investor, what recourse do I have? Is the PI cover in place, or how will you do that? It's sort of related to earlier this um, question about liability. Yeah. So, so we're looking to put PI cover in place, obviously. Um, but as so I we, 
you know, we don't have all the answers, John, about property, but I do have a big team of very experienced people, and we'll do everything we can to make sure that the right deals are put on. And if there's a problem, we believe we will step in to ensure that the lenders get their money back and the interest, because that's you'll be out of business if you don't protect your vendors. So Simon's model is to somehow be that backstop. But also have insurance as well. Yeah. And we've got to, we'll have insurance in case we go out of yeah, business. Yeah, for E&O and stuff. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? I mean, just to sort of talk around that topic a little bit, I mean, there's, there's a ton of stuff we do to try and protect our investment because effectively we've funded the investment. If it goes on the platform and it doesn't sell, it's, it's, it's not a big deal to us because it's already been funded. But, you know, um, in terms of just a sense of being a sensible lending business, we've got, for example, and something we haven't talked about in terms of underwriting, I mean, the biggest risk we see in underwriting is actually fraud. I mean, fraud is the biggest risk in the UK um, in terms of um, mortgage fraud, rather, it's the biggest area of fraud in the UK. It's higher than consumer lending. So, you know, um, things that we do there are, are extensive, but we've got a, um, we've negotiated with Lloyds of London um, syndicate there has given us a policy to cover all of the loans that we originate. Um, you know, we get valuers that will go out, we'll make sure obviously they've got expertise in the relevant area, but also we'll get a copy of their, their PI insurance before we'll actually accept the valuation. We'll make sure that's current with their insurer. Uh, we make sure borrowers have independent legal advice, we make sure that firm is a firm of substance and we'll get a copy of that firm's PI insurance as well. Yeah, I mean, I could so talk the, for a while, but a, you know, it's pretty extensive stuff. There's a difference in law with a company that has a loan they've already done, and then they're selling off pieces of it when it comes to recourse and things. So <coughs> there's some subtle differences going on in the, in the way this is offered. So, another question. Hi, um, if you put some money into into the development you guys are pitching, um, say it's a 12 month, you're pitching it's a 12 month project and it's delayed, um, the money might come back at 12 months, what happens then? You get to lead everything. So for us, we, we recognise property happens all the time delays with the best of the world, you know, weather, all sorts of things can cause problems. So uh, we build in quite a bit of time factor. So if someone thinks they're going to take six months and we'll assess if we agree with that, we'll add an extra three months on and have maybe a target of nine months, but say to the borrowers, look, target's nine months, but be prepared. It could be 12 or, could, or it might be an early to six. So, so we will actually say there's a range. And if you need your money back sooner than the end date, don't invest in this particular one because we can't guarantee you get your money back. So we're trying to put a big amount of time flexibility there because that's really important because anyone who's done property will realise it can take longer than you expect. Any other? I mean, so, so the bad news is I've, I've never seen a development complete on the expected date. <laughs> <laughs> it's normally the other side. Of, I agree with Simon, you built some flex uh, into for a bit of a tail. Um, at Funding Circle, we we have a secondary market if you need liquidity. So if you buy into a loan part and something changes and you need that money back, we have a secondary market where you take that loan part and you can tell it to somebody else. So that, that liquidity expert is really important for us. And a cost? Pardon? And a, and a cost? There's a slight cost to it. Uh, I'm not sure what that cost is. Um, and it's, but it's, uh, it's, it's a proper market. If there aren't any buyers, it doesn't sell. And if the buyer wants to pay a lower price than you want, you have to make a decision. So it's, it's yeah. not like a guaranteed full face value exit, it's what the market wants to pay that day. It might be 50% of what you have on offer. But, but it is a mechanism for liquidity. Right, exactly. It's an important mechanism. It's where the buyers and sellers can find each other. But it's, it's a market. This is not a guarantee. If you're, you're investing in loans. You're not getting guaranteed savings. Jonathan, did you it was, the, it was the same answer for a okay. time, yeah. Other questions, or we can wrap up so you can get on to the rest of the show. <laughs> I think we're done. I want to thank the panel today. I hope